All right. Well, let's get started. So, so thanks again for joining. My name is Stuart Bryson. I'm with Red Pill Analytics. And what we're going to talk about today, um, the title is Know What Your Cloud Data Warehouse Is and Isn't. So the thing we want to talk about today is looking at what brought us to the point where we wanted cloud data warehousing. What was it about on-prem systems that made us start to look for, to the cloud for solutions to, to optimizing these kinds of analytic workflows? Um, and we'll take a look at some of those cloud offerings. I'll give you an ex uh, we'll, we'll take a look at three specifically. And we'll sort of compare and contrast. And what, what I'll do is I'll actually go, go into a drawing mode where I will draw architectures live and sort of discuss the differences in these architectures. So hopefully that makes sense and hopefully that's what everybody thought they were signing up for when they joined the webinar. So let's get started. I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to talk about myself and Red Pill Analytics. Um, and that's the price of uh, getting a free webinar, so give me just a few minutes. If you're interested in following me in any of these social media avenues, please do so. I'd be honored by that. Uh, I am the owner and the CEO of Red Pill Analytics and also the founder. Uh, if you're interested in what Red Pill Analytics does, um, there's a lot of different ways to approach that, but one of the ways I, I like to approach it is just to talk about who are the technologies and the partners. What are the technologies and who are the partners that we partner with? And so you're looking at from data engineering to analytics to data warehouses. These are some of the options that we work with. If you are looking for help in, any, in a project with using any of these technologies or any of these uh, partners, please let us know. We'd be happy to, to talk to you about where Red Pill might fit into your project. Um, also, we're hiring. So we're I uh, have a lot of projects going on and we're constantly looking for new people. So if any of the technologies that I mentioned in the previous slide are interesting to you or something you work with, or if anything you see in this webinar interests you and you think you might want to, you know, reach out to us and, and chat about what a, what a career with Red Pill might look like, please do so. We'd be, we would love to talk to you. And what, what, just really one more slide about Red Pill. And, and when we launched, uh, wow, almost five years ago, we were primarily, when I say primarily, I'll say exclusively, an Oracle services provider on premises. And that's what we knew and that's what we did. But we started pivoting about three years ago to, to focus as much as we could on the cloud. And today, only about 60% of our business is Oracle, Oracle related. And a good portion of that 60% is cloud-based, so Oracle cloud-based work. Um, but I also like to say that 90% of our customers are post-Oracle in something. Now, sometimes that's data warehouses, and we're going to talk about that primarily today. Sometimes that's ETL tools, and sometimes that's analytics tools. And it's a big, wide world now. Um, and you can use a lot of differing technologies from different customers, different cloud, sorry, different vendors, different clouds, all together. Um, and that's what we're seeing a lot with our customers. So we have successfully transitioned 90% of our customers to something that's no longer Oracle. So let's talk about the evolution of data warehousing. We're now into the, into the meat of the presentation. And where we began years and years ago were, were relational databases, right? So you primarily built your data warehouse in a relational database that was used for lots of workloads. So there were very few relational databases that were primarily for data warehousing. There were a few and they got gobbled up by the other big, big vendors and big players. But in general, you were taking a relational database that might have transactional capabilities as, long, as well as decision support, which is a term we used back in the 80s, um, and you would, you would try to make that database fit your specific workload, in this case, data warehouses. And then in the, in the 90s and, and into the, really into the 2000s, we started to see appliances. And appliances, you know, started really with, I'd say, Teradata. I don't know a whole lot about Teradata and really never worked on it, but 
you saw the, the appliance market evolve into the Netezas of the world and then on into the Exodatas of the world, which I do know a good bit about. And those appliances were designed to try to make the heavy lifting of data warehousing much more palatable. If you think about how much data was getting moved in a, in a, in a single analytics query, it's quite often you, need, you needed highly, highly optimized um, solutions. And that's when relational databases, which often played a, a portion of that appliance solution, um, we started to really optimize and so in some cases um, really tweak what that relational database software was doing for these analytic workloads. And then we moved further on into data warehouse and platform software. And that's looking at things like post appliance um, and highly optimized, sometimes leading into the cloud a bit, talking about you know, these sort of solutions that, were, that had moved all the way in the direction of being purely for data warehousing. And that led us into really where we are today, which is uh, a whole host of data warehouse only cloud solutions. So that's, uh, that's, sort, of, that's sort of the evolution of, of uh, how we got to where we are today. And if you now look at, we still have a lot of those options available to us. And so if you're going to build a data warehouse today, these are really the options you might consider. You would go and, and maybe you would provision a, a server or a series of servers, and you would have to you know, buy that hardware, install that software, configure it, you're, you're at, on your own to manage it, uh, et cetera. And there's not a lot of that going on today. There's, 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 I'm, I'm sure there's probably some, some listeners on the, on the webinar today that are still doing that, but there's not a lot of net new solutions in, in that sort of deployment option. Also, you could choose to use an appliance. Now I'm being somewhat generous here by not mentioning the buying of the hardware and the buying of the software and the ins installation of the software, because for some appliances, that kind of happens behind the scenes. Um, and it still has to get installed and maybe you install it or maybe your vendor installs it, which is usually the case, but those things do still happen with some uh, appliances, but in general, you're sort of isolated from worrying about full ownership of those pieces. And then if we think about, you know, what the cloud looks like, and maybe I'm being a little bit generous there as well, but the idea of just swiping a credit card or buying some universal credits or buying um, a universal li uh, user um, in, in, in the cloud. And you simply go and provision this. Maybe you click a few buttons or make an API call and suddenly you have a data warehouse and in most cases a scalable data warehouse ready to use. And it's really an amazing time to be working with data with these new cloud platform options. So why do we care about these different options? Well, because companies and organizations now more than ever are looking for ways to do more with less. Now, some of that comes from just the constant friction of trying to, to you know, cut costs, um, get a better bottom line, uh, nothing new today versus the eighties and the nineties about that. But one thing is we have so much more data now and we're expected to store and use so much more data than we used to. So if you look at data warehousing solutions in the eighties and maybe even the nineties, they were ERP driven data warehouses. Sometimes they were clickstream data warehouses, but nothing like the amount of data we see today from websites and, and events. And the amount of data was very contained. Today, there's so much data out there. And this data is, is, you know, represents possibility. But unless you really get your, your lasso around it, it's really more of a hindrance than it is a benefit. So, so 
with the expectation of doing, of having so much more data and doing so much more with it um, and still trying to watch the bottom line, we need to find value wherever we can. And if we have value by, by removing the installation, removing the configuration, removing the management, then, then we absolutely care about that. There's a lot that goes into a total cost of ownership for a data warehouse. And if you can remove some of that undifferentiated heavy lifting, as Amazon calls it, then there's tons of value in that. And any of the solutions that we're going to look at today, we're going to look at autonomous data warehouse, we're going to look at Snowflake, and we're going to look at Google BigQuery. Any of these solutions, they, some, of, some of them excel in, other area, in some areas more than others, but any of them are uh, a major improvement to an on-prem, either installed data warehouse or even an appliance data warehouse. So if you look at some of the things that we eliminate by moving to a cloud data warehouse, we get, we stop this whole notion of backups. I mean, I mean, if you're still, I did a talk at collaborate this year and the guy that spoke before me was, was talking about database backups and the room was full and that just really took threw me for a loop. I, I can't imagine that, that in today's world, we're still focusing so much on backups. Hopefully, you're in a place where you're moving away from that if you still are. Patching and upgrades, I mean, this is the kind of thing in the cloud, there shouldn't be patching, there shouldn't be upgrades. This is just something that should, that should happen behind the scenes for you. Are things available? You should not ha be having to write scripts to check for availability. You should just get alerted or even self-healing capabilities where if something becomes available, the cloud just makes it available again, either through moving to other availability zones, spinning up alternate um, infrastructure, et cetera. And tuning, there still is a place for tuning over on the right, and that kind of is an optimized experience and application design, but just basic tuning of, you know, IOPS, uh, et cetera, um, trying to get the most out of your storage, um, that kind of tuning is really going away. Uh, the kind of tuning where you're tuning individual SQL statements or API calls, still very much in the game. So when we look over here on the right, there's still tons of work for, for experienced data warehouse and analytics professionals to work on. As a matter of fact, I would argue that the stuff on the right never got the kind of attention it should have. And now we can focus really on doing interesting things with data, solving problems, finding insights, answering questions, unlocking the millions of dollars of value that we have in our data every day. And I like to call it just focusing on those things that machines don't, don't do better than we do. And there's still so much of that. What's the future hold around machine learning? You know, we'll find out. But today, and, and for the foreseeable future, there's still so much that we can do with analytics and data that does require human intervention. And that's those tasks and those disciplines are really what, what get me up in the morning anyway, not making sure a backup is run. So this is why any of the solutions really that we're gonna talk about are quite a leap forward to any of your on-prem systems. <clears throat> and if you really look at what the cloud allows, right? The idea of separating compute and storage, which we'll get into a little bit when I start to drive some architect, when I, when I start to draw some architectures, is a really innovative way um, to, you know, build scalable data warehouses, but it never was possible on-prem because we really didn't have the capability to run storage at massive, highly available at massive scale. And it wasn't until the cloud introduced these options that human, <laughs> human innovation was able to take the next leap forward. So 
the cloud enables an incredible amount of innovation. And that's really what I hope we'll start to focus on in the future. <clears throat> so if you think about enterprise relational databases, they're very, very complicated. Um, and the reason they're complicated is because over the years, they've had to support really multiple workloads. If you think about, uh, you know, I've done lots and lots of data warehousing on on-prem Oracle systems over the years. And one of the, one of the main things that we had to focus a lot of time on is, is just loading and querying in ways that bypassed the transactional engine, which was more designed for handling transactions from OLTP systems. So there was a lot of configuration and management to trying to get Oracle to sort of bypass some of its OLTP uh, ways of doing things. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that one of the reasons that there are so many DBAs in the world is that these things were super complicated and they required you know, very smart people to manage all of the different configurations and tuning and options that, that occurred with these relational systems. But what you'll see when we go to the cloud and specifically talking about data warehousing in the cloud, it all becomes so much more simple when there's only a single workload that you have to support. So when you think about autonomous data warehouse, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, it is in its heart an Oracle database with a lot of that complexity for things like transactions ripped out, right? So you don't have to have super, uh, super experienced DBAs knowing how to turn parameters on and off that are good for data warehousing because they've already done it for you and they don't really even give you the option to undo it. And if you start looking at things like Snowflake and Google BigQuery, they never existed in a world that supported multiple workloads. They were built from the ground up to support singular workloads. So this is what makes really the promise of the cloud is what gives us the ability to focus on individual workloads in this way. We would never be, without the scale of any of the public clouds, you're really not able to innovate in this way. So what we're going to do for the rest, of, what I'm going to do for the rest of this, this talk is draw some different architectures. And, I, you know, I thought um, about how I wanted to, to try to different, differentiate these, these different systems and or these different architectures. And I came across really a couple of different dimensions of, of really how to think about this. And one of the ways... And the, and, the, and the dimensions we really want to talk about are the difference between schema and schema lists and the difference between server and server lists. So as, as I start to draw some of these diagrams and start to pull the different pieces of individual solutions apart, I'll be drawing them in one of these four quadrants with the hope of making it clear to you about where we sort of bleed into server versus serverless and schema versus schemaless. And there are a lot of different dimensions by which you could you know, describe a data warehouse architecture. But I think these are the, to, to really understand the differences between the, the different solutions I'm gonna talk about, this is really the best, two of the best ways. So hopefully that makes sense. So if we look at the first thing I, I really want to draw is I want to draw what an on-prem system looks like. And in the on-prem system, you know, we usually have a nice cylinder to represent a database, right? And that's where we were at in the beginning. And in that single database, we would have a SQL parser and probably some form of ETL. And at the end of the day, you may have an ETL server that runs separate from the database, but regardless, there's a good portion of what that ETL server is generating is actually running on the database itself. And for 
push down technology like Oracle Data Integrator and Warehouse Builder before it, um, the idea was to push as much or all of the processing to the database. So you had in that one cylinder, you had storage and processing power. So the actual, the SQL parser in most cases, everything is going in and out through SQL. You may have had some files, right? Because maybe you had external tables and you're dumping files for loading purposes. Um, and maybe even probably not too long ago or not uh, only recently have we started thinking about the possibility of maybe JSON data as well. And then the, the other way that we really scaled this is by adding additional servers. The idea being that we would scale out both the storage and the processing power across multiple nodes. And this created two very distinct worlds. One that was the shared nothing architectures, things like Natiza, um, which every database instance had its a certain amount of the data and processing that it was responsible for versus sort of the shared nothing architectures like Oracle Rack, where every database instance theoretically could process your request. Um, and we had a whole separate storage layer, either using clustered file systems or ASM that allowed us to sort of keep the data and make the data available to all these different nodes. So real scalability back in the on-prem days was about taking and multiplying these servers or just buying really big, really huge servers that we never had to, to try to scale. <clears throat> now, one of the things that happened uh, with on-prem systems when we were trying to load this data is that this was very, you can see that, maybe we'll draw it down here, very expensive to store data here, both from a licensing perspective, right? Uh, these were millions and millions of dollar systems, uh, but also from these, this is all local storage. So even if you're using a NAS or a SAN where, you, where storage technically isn't local, it's still mounted locally. And so these, and those, and those storage solutions were very expensive as well. So it was very expensive, lots of dollars. If this were Yelp, we would put a whole bunch of dollar signs in there, probably even four, because you couldn't find another way you couldn't find a more expensive way to store your data, honestly. So then we had this movement and still on prem of trying to find cheaper, more commoditized ways to store our data. And that's really where the whole big data and we'll say specifically Hadoop platform, these rose up in the desire to not have such expensive storage um, because we wanted to maybe keep our raw data we, we have, we're, we're starting to see so much more data uh, possibilities, as I mentioned earlier. And, and in these traditional data warehouses, we were throwing away so much data. In some cases, we were throwing away even the detailed data and storing aggregated data, or at least some level of curation where we weren't able to keep every data point. So I would argue that the whole desire for um, for big data and those frameworks was to try to solve this dollar sign issue and also the scalability issue of having every, um, of, of some of the concurrency issues, issues related to specifically shared nothing architectures. So what we saw in these solutions was really just a series of files that would be loaded in a highly distributed system. And these files, bear with me. 
And these files would have some sort of framework around them. And that was originally HDFS as the sort of the building blocks, map reduce as the processing framework. And, and if you're not too familiar with these technologies, don't worry about it because as you'll see in a minute, we don't really need to be um, anymore. And then later on, even MapReduce was pushed out by Spark and in-memory processing. So the whole idea here was we still did data warehousing. There were some organizations and even technologies that tried to completely replace the data warehouse with big data systems through some you know, differing amounts of, of success and failure. There are some companies that absolutely did that and with success, others that never quite got there. And the reason is that these relational data warehouses are really good at what they do, which is reporting back schema. If you notice what we've, the, the things that we've really drawn different here, we're still very much on the server full, not serverless side, but we're separating our relational database for curated data clearly into the schema section. And then our big data technologies, which tended to be schema on read, um, file-based access, uh, very much in a schema-less world. Now, we started to see schema creep in to a lot of the big data technologies through a Hive Metastore, through um, SQL on Hadoop, through SQL on Kafka, through SQL on Spark through SQL on whatever, we started to see uh, more desires for schema. But at its heart, those technologies tend to be schemaless, even when you have an abstracted layer of schema on top of it. So this is sort of the on-prem um, state of affairs before we started innovating in the cloud. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Uh, I'm going to take questions a little bit later, so if you'll bear with me. If you have questions, I think you can go ahead and start to, to enter them. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll look through some of the questions later. So I'm going to clear this now. And let's start talking about... Hold on. There we go. Let's start talking about sort of what happened in the cloud that, that really changed this. And... The biggest thing that happened initially was object store. So that was the first object store was Amazon S3. I believe I'm right about that. It's, it's at least the, the best well-known, um, the, the first one that was well-known, and, and I would argue probably the still the most well-known object store. And that's the idea of just giving consumers or customers buckets. Um, and those buckets represent just a, a blank palette for you to put files in. Now, what is, what is underneath that? What kind of file system is it? What kind of system? You don't care because it's serverless. And you don't care um, as long as it provides you uh, adequate access to your data and it's highly available. And so as, as um, you know, Object Store was not initial, initially for analytics workloads, it was really for serving up data to websites, providing um, storage for download links and um, those sorts of things. Um, it wasn't until later that, that we started figuring out that object stores would be a great place to keep, particularly your raw data, um, because it was cheap and highly available, um, but also all styles of data today. So if we look at what object store looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, we have really a series of files typically, JSON, Parquet, Avro, whatever you want, it began really as in some cases CSV files, which evolved into JSON files, which evolved into lots of different kinds of smart JSON, I like to call it, which is Parquet and Avro are really, you know, JSON files with, or JSON-like files with some um, amount of metadata built in for doing things like columnar access, et cetera. 
But at the end of the day, these are files and file formats. And what's nice about this is that specifically, you know, Amazon or even really any of the clouds, they put a layer of APIs on this that are sort of their, their own APIs. So for instance, get file, put file, Amazon SDK, whether Java, Python, whatever has got APIs for you to put files, take files. People have used those SDKs and their solutions. So sometimes um, those APIs are being used by tools and products and solutions that you've bought and used and you don't even realize it. Another great thing is that they've also adopted some of the um, on-prem APIs um, through either some, some you know, API translation bridge in some cases or just providing you easy, elastic access to Hadoop distributions that you can spin up in the cloud to do things like processing or running Spark jobs and then have them spin back down because the first thing that sort of died um, in the Hadoop distributions in the cloud was the Hadoop side of it. That's the really interesting thing because Object Store replaced the need for the Hadoop file system. So when we have things like EMR and Amazon and Dataproc and the Google Cloud, it's not really the HDFS side of those distributions that are interesting. It's the Spark side or the processing side because the object stores give us the ability to persist our data long term. So this really was a game changer for all of those organizations that had raw data that they had been previously been throwing away because of all those dollar signs in their on-prem data warehousing solutions, but also just the ability to provide, there's so many layers of abstraction that you can put on top of object store that you can actually give first class access to your raw data to different areas of the company. Not everybody needs highly curated data. So the object store provides your data scientists and your discovery people or the people that are doing discovery to look at the raw data and really have an idea of what they're trying to escalate or curate up into the data warehouse. So the first thing that, that we noticed with object store is that it was a nice compliment to, um, to, to really our on-prem brethren uh, for the data warehouse. So the first thing that we started to see was these on-prem data warehouse solutions being, being really run in the cloud without a lot of architectural difference. And I will argue that this is kind of what you have with autonomous data warehouse, at least the first iteration of it. It is very much an Oracle database that has been scaled down, uh, scaled down in complexity because it can, it, it's allowed to run a single workload. But architecturally, it's still very much what you run um, on-prem. So what we have is we still have one or more nodes, and this is all transparent to you because you don't really care how many Exadata boxes or what portion of an Exadata box is being served up to you um, and how it's doing the resource management within that Exadata cluster to provide you elasticity. All these things are happening, but without any major shifts in architecture. It's still ASM, it's still um, you know, local store, ASM mounted as local storage, share nothing architecture, but it's presented to you in the cloud in such a way that the undifferentiated heavy lifting is gone. And you don't really care at the end of the day whether the architecture has, has moved forward or not in a lot of cases, because you, you now have the ability for this data warehouse, because it's running in the cloud, to do some really interesting things because of the availability of Object Store and all of the tooling that has grown up around Object Store. So uh, let's just go through the list of things that, that really um, you know, elevate when you're in the cloud. ETL processing, the idea of a finite amount of processing power, just the database's processing power as our only alternative for running ETL batch and streaming 
is gone because uh, any public cloud gives us the ability to elastically scale processing across all kinds of big data solutions and, and other sort of cloud-based ETL solutions. And also, frankly, the ability to have a data warehouse, whether the underlying architecture has changed significantly from, from Exadata or not, the ability to spin that up with a single API call, and get another instance with literally a, a, a REST call, is amazing the amount of time that we used to scope on projects just for installing dev test qa getting it stood up and and validated was was a long time and now we we really don't have to worry about that so we still have our sql parsing engine running in a server mode so that's not serverless and we still have um, our etl uh, at least the sql side of it's running over here but so much of that processing can be offloaded down here to not just the object store and data and uh, big data solutions, but all the things running in the cloud. So what I would argue is that even though um, autonomous still looks very much, if you look at this diagram, still looks very much like it did in the on-prem days, the amount of heavy lifting that's been removed still makes it valuable. You're not worrying about backups. You're not worrying about availability. Etc. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. And with that, we will we will sort of move forward. Let me just erase a few of these because I want to keep. I want to keep that for my move into talking about Snowflake. So what I want to talk about um, with Snowflake is a really innovative architecture, which again was born in the cloud. So object store was a thing when they were drawing up this architecture. So when they decided how could we make a highly available SQL data warehouse in the cloud, object store was a thing already there. So they made use of that. So we have um, in a schemaless way, we can load JSON files, Parquet files, Avro files into a data lake running an object store, and we can make that stuff available. Or we can start to use object store in a different way. And what Snowflake does is they use the object store as the sort of the gold copy of data. And this is in their own proprietary format, columnar in nature, of a highly optimized way for them to store data. And so we are schemaless, sort of, in the way that, that the data as it's stored on disk here is sort of schemaless. And it's serverless in that it's sitting an object store. However, what we see, let me change the color here, maybe the light blue for Snowflake, they'd probably like that. What you see is that we start to provide schema in a relational manner on top of these files. So there's a serverless translation bridge that gives you your select star from schema, uh, table, column, etc built into the snowflake engine in a in a in a very schema driven way uh, it's not the same schema that you and i are used to from the relational days in uh, all the things that don't really matter in a data warehouse world like the link of var cars and the precision of strings and all that kind of stuff is highly uh diluted because frankly it just doesn't matter and you'll see the same thing in BigQuery, you'll see a lot less precision in defining data types because quite frankly, um, it never really mattered. And uh, from an analytics perspective, and the amount that it mattered from a performance perspective was really frustrating. Uh, so there's really no benefit that was gained there. So all of that's sort of removed. So what we see is we see a, a sort of a blending of our data lake and our data warehouse. Snowflake provides us what's called the, pick another color here, 
the variant, hope I spell that right, probably not, the variant data type, which is a data type that you can define in your schema in a table that really is just an open, unending blank palette for anything you want, such as JSON data. So the idea is that you could load your data lake and your and your elevated data warehouse content all in the same infrastructure. Um, so there's some there's some roadmap for Snowflake that that enhances this distinction between the data warehouse and the data lake even further. And I think there's ex some really super exciting times ahead for that. So now this isn't the end of the story because for Snowflake they've separated compute and storage. So I haven't drawn anything serverful yet, if that's a word. We still, everything is serverless. But Snowflake does have their uh, a server component. And this is, you do define a series of data warehouse instances, one or more or clusters of them. And these instances do use local storage but they use it only solely for caching so our goal copy of data is still very much coming whoops coming from this side or this side arguably depending on whether you have data lake content defined as relational uh, etc you have these servers caching this information now this is really interesting in that I can tell you from having worked with a number of analytics and BI tools, that caching was always an important part of getting immediate response time to end users. Now Snowflake really does that for you in the database or data warehouse tier. So you can have one or more instances of compute that are running and those are caching with much different profiles. So for instance, you can serve up a single um, compute instance for marketing and feel pretty confident that what's gonna be cached there is really just marketing data. You do the same for sales, you can do the same for the ETL backend. You can define elastic minimums and maximums for how big and how many of these things you wanna spin up um, and auto uh, suspend and auto resume. So you don't have to pay for things when people aren't querying. All of, the, all of this built together and packaged gives you really the best of both worlds, which is separation of compute from storage, compute processing, only caching the data uh, that's necessary, maintaining a gold copy of the data absent from local storage. And that's what allows you to have all of the different numbers of compute resources running for all these different workloads because none of them have the gold copy of the data or even any portion of it. So that's Snowflake, very, very interesting. Um, the way that the object store was blended with local storage to really give you um, ideal computing power uh, really just in time. So the, the last thing I really wanna, wanna talk about is BigQuery. So BigQuery um, in some ways is very much like Snowflake and in some ways differently. And what I'll say is that where they differ, neither one is really, I would say, a slam dunk champion. They're for just different use cases. And I'll try to make that clear. So where BigQuery, um, let me get my color here, maybe green. BigQuery still has this idea of schema less serverless data but this is not object store it for all intents and purposes is like object store and that it's highly available automatic you know there's no backup that has to happen because it's automatically duplicated across multiple zones availability zones etc all that's transparent to you but instead of Instead of BigQuery or Google using um, sort of the egalitarian bucket storage that we've all gotten used to with, with S3 and Google Cloud Storage and Blob Storage and, and Azure, 
BigQuery uses its own dedicated, optimized, columnar data format um, sitting in a in non-object store, highly available data. So I'll try to rephrase that in a way, I've probably confused half of you. It's like object store um, in a lot of ways, except that you're not free to define whatever data set or schema or structure, JSON, Parquet, whatever. There just is a columnar proprietary, I think it's open sourced, I'm not sure, but there's a proprietary data format that must be used. One of the interesting things that they just announced at Google Cloud Next this year is that whereas previously that data format and columnar IO storage uh, layer was only available to BigQuery in that it wasn't open. You couldn't go request that storage. BigQuery requested it and you requested data from BigQuery, but you never got to see columnar IO. They've opened that columnar IO format as an API now. So you can choose that storage for your data lake. So instead of you having to put your data lake in object store, you can put your data lake in columnar IO. I've, I've not yet heard of any customers doing that because it's brand new. So I can't tell you um, whether it's going to be, you know, a killer new feature or not, but it at least seems on the surface that it would be because now your data lake can be columnar and structure just like your data warehouse. And in fairness to Snowflake, when you defined variant data types, and store data in JSON and then use the built-in Snowflake JSON parsers, you got columnar performance as well. So Snowflake did some of the nastiness around uh, making your data sets columnar and performance, at least in caching, behind the scenes for you. But, but BigQuery is now opening up the storage layer for you to be able to use that optimized storage for your data lake and your data warehouse. So that's where your data sits. And now where does the schema come in? The schema and we're not, we're, for BigQuery, we're, we're, we're not gonna go over to the server side at all. That's where it really differs from Snowflake in that we would have, we will have a series of serverless compute processes. And by serverless, there's no, you're not going into a UI and you're not saying, give me an extra small or an extra large and with this many CPUs and this, many, this much memory. Um, I mean, everything, nothing's technically serverless. Everything runs on the server somewhere. The concept of serverless being that it's not a named server or known server that you can really speak of. And what happens is as queries are spun up uh, to get data, sorry, to get data from any of these processes, we simply are sent to what BigQuery calls slots. So at any time of the day, there's a whole fleet of these uh, server slots, which are basically just slices of compute power that are running across I wouldn't call it a massive cluster because the instances don't really have to talk to one another. It's just a massive fleet of compute, anonymous compute that's running in that magic data center that Google has. And anytime you request a query from BigQuery, BigQuery will, will go and find you a slot to process your request. That slot will have the compute available for you to query the columnar IO data and return that back to you. And then whether your next time you issue that query goes to the same slot, there is some affinity logic built in for you to reuse slots. Uh, in, you, you know, if you're issuing queries and data sets close to one another, you can imagine Google's probably doing a lot of machine learning behind the scenes to handle a lot of this. But at the end of the day, there is some intelligence built in to try to not reinvent the wheel with each query but nothing's guaranteed. The other thing is that every time you issue a select statement against BigQuery, it automatically caches the results of your query relationally in system tables behind the scenes. So that gives you similar caching function, functionality that um, 
Snowflake has. So the, by default, that stores that for the last 24 hours, just does hashing algorithms to figure out whether your SQL statement is exactly the same. And if it is exactly the same, it just pulls the data from a table that was basically constructed in a manner similar to a CTAS the first time you queried it. So that's how Google kind of handles caching. Instead of needing to cache it locally, it caches it in the storage um, in these system tables. So that's BigQuery and that's the difference. So with that, I'm kind of done with, <clears throat> with the drawing portion of this. I hope that was meaningful and not, hopefully it was beneficial in the way I, I wanted it to be and not um, distracting. Um, with that, I'm gonna see if we could take some questions. Mike Jellin, are you on? Yes, sir. Do we have any questions? We do, we have two of them. Uh, we have one, uh, the first question is, what is the disaster recovery solution for Oracle's autonomous data warehouse? Just wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so the backup, so you, you've got backup jobs that run and those backup jobs write the data to, to object store and their object store is highly available. So you have, it, it's, you know, it's still a step removed from being automatically highly available. But the idea that some of these things that you have to do behind the scenes on prem, like configure and own backup jobs and make sure that the backup jobs are running and make sure that what those backup jobs do is restorable. Um, all of that is, has uh, been abstracted away and is, 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 is running behind the scenes. So it's really just, um, if you have a disaster and that um, you'll be restoring, but what you need to restore has already been built in and verified for you. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, this is really when we, just for the audience uh, purposes here, we have a comparison or question related to BigQuery to Snowflake. So yep. the question is, does BigQuery perform the same type of optimization on semi-structured data as Snowflake's variant? It does, yeah. So when you look at, first off, first off the columnar I.O. solution, um, anything that you put in BigQuery proper is columnar by default. Prior to Cloud Next this year, if you were putting data in GCS or Google Cloud Storage and defining, um, for those Oracle folks on the, on the call, you know what an external table is. So BigQuery's had that functionality of sort of having an external table-like uh, feature that could reach out to things like Google Sheets, which was nice, Google Cloud Storage, and other things. It did not do that kind of columnar, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, improvements, performance improvements that Snowflake did for you behind the scenes. But now, one of the reasons they've opened up columnar I.O. as a format for you to, to load your raw data is that it will be stored in a columnar fashion. So if you start to use the new columnar I.O. data format, everything from your data lake to your data warehouse will be columnar all the way, and you will get that same optimization that Snowflake gives you. But if you're still using Google Cloud Storage, there's nothing really in there at this point that's giving you that columnar optimization that Snowflake gives you. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, another question, I'm going to maybe adapt this question a little bit um, and just really have you talk about, when you look at the last several years of, you know, where Oracle, Snowflake, and BigQuery have, have morphed to, and really where do we see that momentum going in the future from just adoption rate and what customers are using or looking at? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a great question, Mike. I think what we're seeing is, is Amazon. So let, 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 me, let me see if I can paint this picture because I haven't talked a lot about Amazon and it's a good opportunity to. I talked about S3, obviously, but I didn't talk about the Amazon data warehousing solution. That's because it's in flux a little bit. And I think it will sort of answer your question in that, you know, um, Amazon was first really to the cloud data warehousing business using what's called Redshift. 
But really, Redshift wasn't innovative in any way. It was a Postgres database really ported to the cloud. Over time, they have improved it and optimized it. Uh, but at the same time, it's still local storage, it's kind of the same sort of profile of what you would run on-prem. Now, then they introduced, we've always had S3, that was our first object store, and people have always been putting analytic workloads there. But then they opened up the Redshift SQL parser, pulled it out, and kind of made it serverless. And this is called Athena. And so Athena is a serverless implementation of a SQL parser so that you don't need individual compute to parse SQL. And this is the first step towards separating compute and storage, is really making your parser um, not having to run individually in, in individual nodes. And so now that Athena and Spectrum solution allows you to, to, to parse data from object store and I think what you'll see with Amazon is a move more in the Athena and, and S3 direction and, and away from, you know, Redshift. So with that example, I'll, I'll draw the comparison that I think you're going to see all of these cloud data warehouses move further and further around separating compute and storage. At this point, it's really only autonomous and Amazon Redshift that are still using local storage. That's the first thing you're gonna see both of those, in my opinion, both of those vendors try to push further and further away because using local storage is a major scalability uh, li limiter, right? You may be inside an Exadata box and as long as you don't need data uh, sizes larger than an Exadata box can suffice, then you're gonna have pretty good performance. But what happens when you hit, start hitting those data uh, amounts that that mean you you've outgrown a single exadata box uh, there are issues so the, I think the long-term trend is more and more serverless I think you'll start to see a 50 50 split probably on the schema and the schema list we'll, we'll continue to to look at data lake and data lake like workloads for raw data and we'll still continue to curate the data but I think everything will be on the left or the, uh, sorry, on the right serverless side and almost no server uh, requirements at all. All right, and, and one final question. We're at the, the top of the hour here, so we're, we're short on time. Apologize for those that we didn't get to from a question perspective. Um, just one last question here. So Stuart, you just talk a bit about, all right, if someone has all or many primary sources of data is on-prem, you know, how does cloud data warehousing fit or how should people be thinking about leveraging the cloud? Yeah, it's really, it's a lot easier um, than, than a lot of people think it is. And it's also a lot easier than it used to be in that we have this great option of object store. So all the clouds have this uh, ability for you to, with very simple APIs and very simple tooling, write data to a bucket. This can be uh, data that you're streaming in from your relational database using things like change logs, et cetera. Or you can write that straight into, and there's a lot of tools, open source and paid that, that make this very simple for you to just replicate relational data into Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage or Columnar IO um, in the future. Um, and you can just write the data there. Once it's there, there's so much cloud tooling. Again, there's so many options, it's difficult to nail them down. But there's, once you get your data in the object store, it's really easy to get it into any of these uh, cloud data warehouses. If you look at both Snowflake and BigQuery, you can actually cause the loading of data into relational tables just by dropping data into a particular bucket and everything else is handled for you get the right data in the right format, drop it in a bucket, it gets loaded. So I think that if you have a lot of on-prem data, the idea that, it does, that your data warehouse should be on-prem as well, I think is really a dated concept because if you think about it, analytics and large data workloads are made for the cloud in the amount of, of elasticity and scalability that are required to serve up those kind of data sets. 
So get it in an object store and then the rest is, is, you know, there's no heavy lifting after that. Perfect. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, just to, to wrap things up here, I know we didn't get to everyone's question. If there is a question that we didn't get to, or maybe you want to dive further into that question, uh, feel free to reach out to us via our, our website or social media. Uh, and then also the recording of this presentation will be sent out to all of the attendees uh, later on this week. And we thank you for, for carving out some time to, to learn more. Uh, and Stuart, thank you for your time to help educate everyone today. Yeah, thanks everyone. So look to, uh, um, you know, look for us for some more webinars in the future. I hope you'll attend those as well. And, and thanks again for attending.